Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Uh, tonight we depart from our usual uh, projects of highlighting legislative issues to talk about something that's very topical in the month of February, and that is black history. And today I'm pleased to be joined by Mike Arujo. Mike, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Mike, you, uh, you have a new job, so why don't we take a, a moment and, and cover your resume? Because uh, <laughs> sure. uh, last time you were in the studio, you were working for the Restaurant Opportunity right. Center. Um, you had been uh, in here previously with the stagehands, but right. now, now you've got a, a, a new gig. Why don't yeah, you let our the, viewers know uh, what um, you're doing? Executive Director of Rhode Island Jobs with Justice. And uh, what is Jobs with Justice? Uh, we're a community-based and labor-based coalition organization that's trying to make the economy work for everybody. Yeah. And how long have you been executive director? This is month four now, uh, and it's been a busy four months. What kind of things <laughs> are you working on? Uh, well, um, we've been working on restoring some wages for some restaurant workers, and we won a pretty significant victory. We won uh, $72,000 in lost wages. The employer actually wrote a check directly to the employees. That almost never happens. And you got great press on that one as well. We did. Yeah. It was really surprising. The funny thing is that nobody knew what to do. You win and you don't know what to do. I mean, that's the thing. It's like you're prepared to keep the fight going and then ultimately, so there's the picket line just kind of petered out eventually. We all went to the Department of Labor and got their checks and it was great. Good for you. Good yeah, for it's, you. Very, it's nice when that happens. And what else is on the near horizon for Jobs with Justice? Well, so we're working on the Bannister House campaign, which is actually really with SEIU uh, 1199, um, which is actually makes a lot of sense during Black History Month, considering it's 102 years old this year, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and is a um, nursing home founded explicitly and specifically for um, African-American women. And I don't think there are very many places that focus on African-American women like that. And it's really important that we keep a place like that open and keep it paying good jobs to the community. And they have a new owner, and I guess yeah, there's so some they threats do. to its existence. Right, right, right. So they, there was a threat to their existence about a year and a half ago. Um, the union came together, 1199 came together, and helped find and broker a new purchaser for the place, which was very important. Um, it kept people from being displaced, disrupting families. I mean, it really shows you what labor actually does. Like, people think about labor as contracts and conditions in the workplace, but really it's about holding communities together, and that's what they did. Um, so, in their contract, though, they're looking for um, lower contributions to their health care. The new owner wants to do the things that owners do, which is destabilize hours, um, increase contribu employee contributions in health care, establish a two-tier wage structure, which 1199 is rightly rejecting and is taking to the streets about that. So, uh, to get back on track. Um Labor history is an important issue. Black history is an important issue. Um, perhaps you could uh, uh, give us a little insight on yeah. building the two, because in my role as, um, as being active in the Labor History Society, um, having done a little bit of look at what's you know what we have in Rhode Island. There's not a whole lot of information about um, you know, black history, mm. minority history, as it relates to the labor movement. Um, but here it is, Black History Month. You know what? You know what would you tell viewers? You know, in Black History Month, that they should be aware of that they might not be aware of. There's a, um, a stereotype in labor um, about what the working class looks like in the United States, um, and that picture is almost always a might be slightly younger than middle-aged white man, usually a construction worker. <clears throat> it's a hard hat. Um, and that's not to say that it doesn't exist, but really the face of labor is a much broader 
picture and a much more diverse picture. Um, in the United States in particular, there's only one population that was brought to this country specifically to work, um, and that was African Americans. There is almost always an aspirational aspect to every other population that came, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's definitely part of what we want. But as far as a working class goes in this country, the original working class of the United States was enslaved African Americans. Um, the first strikes came from African Americans refusing to work, but that hasn't always been part of labor's story. We always tended to compartmentalize the post-industrial and the pre-industrial as two very, very separate things. We also don't think of African American, enslaved African Americans as industrial workers, but they were very much industrial workers. Um, they were the first victims of a globalized economy. Right? They were ripped from their homelands, taken to plantations where, again, the image of a plantation owner is a southern gentleman in a big hat sipping on a mint julep. But really, there were corporations that were owned by multiple parties. Many of them existed in New England. Um, Rhode Island was a central feature of the triangle trade, being a significant shipping port, um, some of the first purpose-built slave ships that were constructed in the United States were built in Rhode Island, um, often by slave labor. Um, Smith Castle in North Kingston has large set of slave quarters attached to it. Um, Little Compton was largely uh, um, populated by enslaved people with very few plantation owners. Those folks worked. They built mills. They tended fields. They tended. Um, cattle, they built ships, they navigated, they loaded, they unloaded, but they were never considered part of the working class, and I think there was a, an issue there. I know when most students think about slavery, they think about the Civil War era, mm. and Rhode Island being a northern state, um, you think about it as a state that is anti-slavery, but that's not the complete right. story of yeah, Rhode it's Island. Yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the story, and that's not to say, like, um, Rhode Island's representatives to the Continental Congress, for example, like Hopkins, was very anti-slavery. Um, he was considered himself a true abolitionist, but he was a rum trader. So he profited pretty significantly from the slavery. Um, we don't think about slavery as part of a, a kind of a continuation of labor. We also try to think of slavery as something that belonged to the South exclusively. But the futures market, the stock market, um, and trading almost all happened in the north, and most plantations were owned by corporations that were pa owned both in, the United, in New England, but in the northern sections of New England, and in the rest of the world. Um, I know when I think about Rhode Island's industrial history, I think about textiles, and I, right, I imagine well, how dependent uh, Rhode Island industry must have been on southern cotton on plantations. Cotton. Yeah, so there's something. There's an interesting thing uh, about that. So if you, obviously Rhode Island's mills could only function with material, raw material that came. And the raw material that came was cotton. I mean, there was wool production, but that was very, very small in the United States. And the shipping cost for wool was huge. And also it was a very, very fragile product. Um, it was had a tendency for pests to come to it. So it was not a central product here. But we think of the North in the Civil War era as an industrial powerhouse, um, as a driver, an economic driver. But really, um, it wasn't. The, uh, if you look at the gross domestic product of the United States a couple of days before the Civil War, if you added up all the railroads, all the shipping, all the mills, all the roads, it added up to one-tenth of the value of the output of enslaved labor. Um, which meant that because slavery was producing the vast majority of economic output of the United States, it was the economic engine. And many of those companies still exist. Um, Wachovia was a cotton trading company. Um, Lehman Brothers traded exclusively in cotton and slaves. They famously had a, a shipping office on Pearl Street in New York. Um, but beyond that, getting back to kind of a more labor focus, um, in the early part of the 18th century, 19th century, Thomas Powderly and the Knights of Labor, um, as the United States was getting more industrialized, realized that there needed to be some defense for working people. Um, and so he, they organized the Knights of Labor. <clears throat> and the Knights of Labor do not get the recognition that they really should get. Thomas Powderly 
a white northern industrial worker, um, believed that a labor movement that didn't include everybody would never succeed. And this is an organization that predates the what's now known as the AFL-CIO? Yeah, by almost, uh, I think, almost 50 years it predates the formation of the AFL. <clears throat> um, he really believed in an equality of labor, and he believed that in the supremacy of labor at the same time, um, which is something I think that, that most people would agree. I mean, we frame it as a consumer economy, but it's a maker's economy. Workers build things, and we trade them with each other, and that's how we survive. He wanted to include everybody in an economy that worked for everybody. Um, the birth of the eight-hour movement started with Thomas Powderly, um, and he doesn't get the recognition. His board was made up of women, Chinese-American workers who were hugely persecuted against at the time, and African-Americans, and that was significant. Another piece of untold uh, history, and the Knights had a presence here in Rhode Island. Absolutely, as well. um, in the northern sit industrial cities, they were hugely powerful. Um, they, I mean, there were obviously some flaws with it, depending on the character of, of each. Um, what they call it? They called it a lodge. Knights of Labor had lodges, um, but by and large, they had to adopt an anti-racist or at least a non-racist principle, which allowed. Um, black workers to engage in the economic, in economic democracy for the first time. Um, it also, because of Thomas Powderly's belief, it was a way to propagate abolitionist ideas, which was so important. Um, it was really a valuable moment. So fast forwarding a few years, in the South, in the um, immediate post-war years, you saw organization of black workers and northern workers in the South uniting with each other, particularly um, newly arrived immigrants from Italy and Ireland, um, organized and protective mutual aid organizations with themselves. The, um, during Reformation, was it rest, or was it restoration? Restoration. Restoration. They, um, they did very well. They put together some of the first cross-racial, cross-national organizations. Um, immigrant workers in the Northeast faced a lot of discrimination. Uh, the tendency to move south was important. Also, there was a huge vacuum of work in the south. Uh, so they arrived, and they found themselves either in competition with African-American workforce that was already there, and instead of doing the thing that we, history sometimes likes to make us think, which is like a, a competitive version of history, they went for a cooperative version of history, and they formed some of the earliest southern unions. Some of the strongest unions were organized in the south in that period because of that. Um, and that was really important. During that period, however, obviously, Klan violence was hugely, um, was a central feature of African American life um, in the South and in many Northern cities as well. Participation in the political process was often denied. And anytime workers united across racial lines, uh, the Klan rose up more aggressively. And the Klan was primarily, um, you know, um, anti-black, but uh, they had a very Not prominent yeah. anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant right. feature that most people don't right, know. Right, right. So they were organized specifically to suppress um, newly found black political power and black economic power. That was the, the impetus that Bedford Forrest had when he organized the Klan. However, because of the tendency of working people to unite you had to include immigrants and Catholics in that. Um, the idea that there was a population that could see beyond their own narrow self-interest and work for the betterment of everybody was more than they could bear. And so, I mean, honestly, we saw the Klan's reign last from about 1870 to like 1950. I mean, it was probably one of the longest, most aggressive periods in, the, in, in this country. It's one third of this country's history in the South was ruled by denying economic, um, democracy and civil democracy to African Americans and immigrants. Um, that's part of the reason why you see the birth of right to work laws came from the South. They didn't come from the North. They came specifically to disrupt working people's organizations. And that's, that was where that came from. But when you move forward though, so you see employers trying to take advantage, oftentimes using the Klan to break strikes and using other racist organizations to break strikes and break workers or threaten or chase down or act as spies against any time workers tried to unite with each other. Um, employers had this mistake like they did with 
immigrants. There's no shortage of short-sightedness when it comes to, to some sets of people. And um, they believe that immigrants made for a docile population, which is why they imported so many immigrants to the Northeast, not expecting them to be like expecting better conditions. And they also assumed that because slaves knew slavery, once they were freed, they would be docile workers. Um, the idea that people don't actually desire freedom or that they don't understand equality on some basic level is a crazy assumption, but they really made it. So people like um, the Pullman porters, uh, I think it was Thomas Pullman, only tried to only employ formerly um, captive African Americans mm -hmm. as workers, figuring that this would be the most docile group of people in the world. But these, there's no better organizer on the face of the earth. This is a group of people that knew actual slavery, not wage slavery, not something like slavery. They knew actual slavery, but they also knew actual freedom. And so they could tell a story of both those things. And because they were working on railroads, they could travel the entire country. It was the worst idea on Thomas Pullman's part, but it was the best idea for labor in general. They brought their message of equality from every coast, every tiny town. Um, when the railroad workers started to, to uh, fight for an eight-hour day, the general, the great strike, um, they were there saying how important it was. They became, because of their organizing efforts, they became the first recognized African-American union in the AFL Federation, which was quite a leap. Samuel Gompers was not a progressive when it came to race issues, but their force, their power, definitely illustrated that. And that period was short. And uh, their leader, A. Philip Randolph, is, is, a, is hero. a labor icon. Yeah, he's an icon. And he's one that I think people should really, he had a vision of America that is so much broader than the one that I think we think of. Um, one that was inclusive and open and wealthy and free. Um, and he also believed in like common values of labor's common values, in spite of whatever opposition you're thrown. Labor believes in the unity of workers. And labor believes that workers have a better vision of the world and are better at it than other people to manage their own affairs, and they should be trusted to do so in their own organizations. And that was tremendous. A. Philip Randolph also, most something that people don't know, also had his protege was Bayard Rustin. And Bayard Rustin was a, an African-American Quaker, um, openly gay, union organizer, and relentless when it came to that. He cared deeply about freedom. He saw it as the, the overarching principle of our world. And he saw it as something that all oppressed people need to achieve. And that included working people. He was <clears throat> one of the architects of the modern civil rights movement. He and Ida B. Wells. It's, he's often written out, and so is Ida. And we tend to focus on leaders like Martin Luther King because it's much easier. But it was Bayard Rustin and Ida Wells that kept an economic focus as part of a civil rights platform. And he also turned the civil rights movement from something that was marginal in the 30s and 40s into something that became the defining feature of the middle of the United States. It's the defining feature of the 20th century of the United States, um, where we saw 12 million people go from no political power whatsoever to having tremendous political power and start to be taken seriously. This was the effort of men like, like Baird Rustin, but also the Reuter brothers, Reuter brothers of UAW, and the CIO organizing across racial lines when nobody else would. They did it. And that is something you can never go back from. That's why it's now it's more important than ever that we make sure when we're organizing, we're including all workers. And when we sit in a room, we have to ask who's not in the room. That's yeah. what he teaches. And, and that goes true to this day where we have a new wave of immigrants in the state and, right. uh, and uh, really highlights the importance of attending to their needs and desires as well as that traditional union member that you described right. at the beginning of our show. Right. I mean, that's, so I would say that that is actually traditional unionism. That that's a unionism that goes back to the 1700s of, of um, people forced to work under terrible conditions and figuring out how to make it better. 
that is, that's the shape of unionism. So when we see immigrants come in, whether they're refugees or if we see unemployment rates in some districts of Providence reaching 40%, we have to say, what, as labor, how can we fix this? Because we're better able to fix it. We've been through more. We're like the Pullman Porters. We remember what it was like when it was really bad, but we also have a vision of what it can be like when it's really good, and we need to deliver that vision. Yeah. Mike, unfortunately, we're out of time, but, but you, you do such a terrific job oh, of you. painting a picture with your words. I, I thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision Health and Safety Issues in the Workplace. We're with Dr. Lee Okorowski, the Medical Director of the Occupational and Environmental Health Centers of Rhode Island. Doctor, welcome and thank you for being with us. Good to be back. So last week we talked about cold and flu issues, uh, primarily for indoor workers, you know, people that work in an office setting. Uh, this week we're going to stay on a similar topic but switch it to workers that are working outside, you know, and their risk factors, their issues, and what they can do to protect themselves while they're working, you know, through the winter months. Yes, uh, very again, a very timely topic. Uh, just to recap, uh, we went over some of the health risks for indoor workers. A, a lot of the same um, health prevention applies to outdoor workers, but there's some very uh, special things that outdoor workers have to consider that indoor workers don't. Just a quick recap, you know, in case someone missed last week, you know, when is cold and flu season? Who's at risk? You know, what's, what are the basic things you can do to, you know, protect yourself so you don't get sick over the winter and you know then we can go into the specifics of great yeah cold and flu season for both indoor and outdoor workers is the same it typically extends from late october early november all the way through april um, and as we discussed before almost everybody in the working population you know can can probably benefit from getting a flu flu shot flu vaccination to help prevent and minimize the impact of flu. Um, the outdoor worker really has some, some extra issues they have to be concerned about. Um, but just like the indoor worker, um, when the outdoor worker starts to feel the onset of symptoms, um, taking care of yourself early is really important. Um, some simple things you can do is really get some good rest, um, get to bed early. Um, really try to minimize the, the stress at home and in the workplace as best you can. And also um, try to stay hydrated and, and keep the fluids moving. And, and those are some of the simple things you can do um, to really, if you do in fact start to come down with a cold or flu, help minimize the impact. Yeah, I think staying hydrated is a good tip because you don't typically think when you're working outside when it's cold, you know, that you need to be drinking as much water right. as you would in the summer. but. Yeah, that's a great segue to the whole concept of, of, of cold stress. Many people are, are familiar with the term heat stress. There, there really is a constellation of illnesses and injuries related to cold stress. And, you know, the take-home message here is that extreme cold really does represent a dangerous environment and can lead to a number of significant health concerns and even health emergencies um, related um, to a variety of different exposures. Um, yeah, you don't, we don't necessarily think, you know, we think, we know in the summer you need to protect yourself from the heat, but the cold is just, just as bad, if not worse. It's, it's different. I think that's a fair thing. And, and, and I often get asked a lot about uh, some, some, some basic definitions and conditions, and, and maybe we can talk about some of those. The first one that, you know, people often ask about is, you know, what is hypothermia? And, um, how does it occur? And, and hypothermia, in, in its simplest terms, is a result of exposure to extreme cold in which the body loses heat faster than it can be produced. Um, early symptoms can be, you know, uncontrolled shivering, um, loss of can, uh, coordination, uh, things like confusion and disorientation. Um, if not appropriately treated, um, late symptoms can actually include things like no shivering, um, blue skin, dilated pupils, slowed pulse, uh, slowed breathing, and ultimately loss of consciousness um, 
and, and death. And so when, when an outdoor worker starts to experience some of the early signs of, of hypothermia with sh uncontrolled shivering, loss of coordination, often some slurred speech confusion, it's really time to contact your safety supervisor and, and take care of it early. And this is not, this is not that uncommon. Um, we see this um, on many outdoor job sites that, that continue throughout the, the cold periods. And, and of course, the way to prevent that, and we can talk about that a little later, is you know, adequate clothing, staying dry. Um, but it's really a condition that you know, many people start to experience the early signs of. And if they neglect those signs, it can progress into, progress into something more serious. Yeah, so awareness is most important in prevention and you know, taking care of yourself. Yes. Uh, is one of the best ways. And it also seems loss of coordination, loss of confusion. So it seems like you should be w looking out for your fellow workers. Especially for workers that work at heights, it can be a really significant issue. You hear a lot about frostbite as well. What, what's the difference? I think a lot of people think they're you know, very similar, but what, what's actually the difference between hypothermia and frostbite? Another good question. Hypothermia really applies to the whole body. Um, whole body heat loss. Frostbite is, is a much more uh, sp a, a, a condition that affects specific tissues. So frostbite is really a, a condition that is an injury caused to, by tissue freezing. And it typically affects the extremities, uh, the feet, the hands, toes, and fingers, um, but also can affect significantly the face with nose, ears, cheeks, chin, et cetera. And those are really the vulnerable areas um, uh, that can, can get tissue literally that's frozen. And that's a significant also cold stress injury slash illness that needs to be appropriately cared for. Um, a poorly controlled or repetitive frostbite can lead to permanently damaged tissues. And one thing that's important to remember with frostbite is um, we're, we're dealing with an aging worker population, and there is some evidence that older workers, workers with cardiovascular disease, and also workers with diabetes are at increased risk in cold environments for frostbite just because of circulation issues. Um, but the key thing for frostbite is, again, just like hypothermia, early recognition and prompt treatment. Um, clearly prevention takes a role with appropriate uh, clothing, but if the symptoms do start, you'll start to see um, evidence of reduced blood flow to the tissues. And uh, what the individual often experiences is, is sensations of numbness, uh, sensations of tingling and stinging. Um, it can also cause um, generalized aching and pain in the affected area. And then the hallmark is bluish or pale um, uh, skin affected tissue that actually blanches out and it really demonstrates the evidence of, of, of freezing. In its extreme stage, you'll actually see some, you know, if it's repetitive, you can see chronic uh, frostbite leading to blackening of some of the tissues. Um, the key take home messages for this one is, again, get medical attention promptly. Um, there's a lot that should be handled by professionals once this is, su is suspected because the individual has to be rewarmed. But a couple simple things that take home messages, typically we warm tissues back up in a warm water bath. And the other thing that can be counterintuitive is when tissues are, are in fact affected, it's not to vigorously rub because if the, if the tissues are in fact frozen, we can actually be causing more damage. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.
Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Welcome to Health and Safety Issues on Labor Vision with Leo, Dr. Leo Kurowski, the Medical Director of the Occupational and Environmental Health Center of Rhode Island. Thank you for being with us tonight. Good to be back. Uh, so today we're going to talk about cold and flu season. You know, it's cold out today. Uh, you know, it's, we're right in the middle of it, I think, but we just want to make sure we know what we're talking about and we know how to protect ourselves in and out of the workplace. Yes, great timely topic. It's sadly, or depending on your bent, that time of year again, where we all uh, have to protect ourselves from cold and flu uh, in the workplace. And what we're going to talk about today is mainly in the office environment, how we can all help minimize our risk for, for cold and flu. So right off the bat, when is cold and flu season? I know, you know it runs for a long time. A lot of people don't know when it actually starts and ends. You know, when, when is it and when are you most at risk? Well, it's, 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 a, broad, it's a broad duration of time. Uh, typically, most people accept somewhere late October, early November, all the way through April. Um, and that's, that's typically when we see the highest uh, rates of cold and flu um, in the Northeast. So who is most at risk for, you know, cold and flu symptoms being exposed uh, is there a specific population or is everyone at risk? Well, the simple answer is everybody. But if you actually break it down, there are some other groups that do have some increased risk. Um, any population that's exposed oftentimes to a diverse population that travels or can be exposed to populations of kids, um, there is some data that some of these folks do, in fact, have increased risk of cold and flu. Oftentimes, it's working mothers who, who both work in an office setting but also are exposed to care of their children either in daycare or schools to to a lot of different people that may in fact have active cold and flu. Should those people get a flu shot? Who should be getting a flu shot and when should you get that flu shot? Again the uh, simple answer is most everybody uh, children and adults do benefit from a flu shot. Um, CDC now recommends Center for Disease Control that anybody can actually get a flu shot. Uh, typically starting this year, we started late August, early September. And it can, if you don't get one, you can still get one all the way through the flu season, um, definitely as late as even April or May. But typically the ideal time is sometime early or mid-fall, and that should cover you for the cold and flu season for that given um, winter, winter period. So I've taken the precautions, I've gotten my flu shot. What else can I do you know, in my workplace to minimize my risk? Great, great question. Um, the first thing is things you can do for your, your whole body health, and that's really stay wet, rested, try to minimize stress, um, stay hydrated, um, general wellness and well-being, eat well, um, and, and get good routine sleep. Um, those are some of the factors that can, in addition to the flu shot, that can help you um, prevent colds and flus. Now separately, in your own work environment, there are some hygiene things you can do to, to also minimize. Those are simple things like monitor your, your hand washing, um, keeping your workstation clean, keyboards, phones, or typically, if they're shared, are often, often um, vectors for colds and flus. Uh, simple hand sanitizer, uh, wash wipes that can clean those pieces of equipment off do seem to help and help prevent colds and flus in the, in the office environment. So even if you do all the prevention, you know, start to feel sick, what are the signs that, you know, you might be coming down with something? Typically, yeah, um, you know, most folks, many folks, uh, people can average one to two colds colds a season, some people even higher than that. Um, but the, the symptoms that typically occur first are what's called a prodrome of the illness, where, where you start to, you know, you feel more fatigued than normal, 
you get the body aches, the myalgias. Now with colds and flus, there are different signs and symptoms, and we won't get into the specifics of each of those. But you, the general for both is you typically start to feel run down, tired, fatigued. You start to develop the symptoms of either an upper respiratory illness. Um, and that's really where there's some real things you can do to help minimize that impact. And that's, um, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, when you feel like you're starting to come down with something, that's really the time to actually start your treatment and recovery. And things you can do is, once you start to feel run down, tired, or fatigued, start to get extra sleep. Start to stay more hydrated. Keep the fluids going. Start to try to minimize stress at home and in the workplace. Um, and those are some of the early things you can do to really help minimize the impact if you are, in fact, going to develop full-blown cold and flu. Say I have developed full-blown cold and flu. Should I stay at work? How long should I stay at work? You know, what should I do you know, to make sure I get back, get back in time and right. don't come down again? Yeah, the, si the simple answer for that is if you have a cold or a flu that's serious, flu is always serious, by all means stay out of work um, and clearly stay out of work if you have an active fever or if you have an active or uncontrollable cough. Your, your colleagues at work will thank you um, and a lot of people, you know, they're going to gut it out, they're going to they're going to ride it out. Uh, if you're really active with a cold or flu, the best thing to do is stay home. That's something that's going to benefit you as the one with the cold and flu, but also benefit your colleagues and not spread it through the office. A um, couple caveats to that. Typically, don't consider to come back to work for at least 24 to 48 hours after your fever, if you have one, has broken um, without things like Tylenol or Motrin on board. So you really want to make sure you're, you're no longer febrile. Um, also, until you've, your, your cough is controllable, um, it's, it's something that will minimize the risk, again, to the, your other coworkers. So it sounds like it's very easily spread. If one person has it, it can spread through the whole workplace and slow everyone down. Absolutely. And you'll start to see uh, many companies are starting to put out uh, cold and flu information sheets, when to recognize a cold, how to cough, you know, the, you know, not into your hands, but into your shoulder. That's another good technique to help minimize colds and flus in the workplace. Um, a lot of uh, workplaces now have, you know, hand sanitizers in the workplace. And a lot of workplaces, in fact, actually have uh, materials for also for you to clean your workstation in the, in the, in the winter period. So um, look for uh, things that your company offers, and if they don't, you know, it's a suggestion that um, might be appropriate for, for your workplace. It seems like these are small issues, small things you can do that, you know, help and prevent a lot of major issues down the line. Yeah, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of prevention that can help. Um, on, the, on the other side, um, this is a big issue. It, it's it's uh, each year cold and flu's impact on the economy is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So there's a lot of work, lost work time associated with these. So if we can take care of them appropriately, it benefits everybody. Um, and, and the other factor is, you know, just remember what you, what you bring home from the workplace can also impact your family. And then there's secondary effects of having to take care of sick kids or, or arrange for care when you're sick. So it really can affect uh, you know, a broad group, if not taken care of inappropriately, in an appropriate manner. All right. So it seems like if you, you know, if you recognize you're getting sick, the best course of action is to, you know, rest, drink pr plenty of liquids, stay home so you don't get anyone else sick, and you'll be back sooner ra rather than later instead of letting it go too far. Absolutely. And there's some other things, too, we can touch on real briefly. Um, Prevention with attire. Now, most people think, you know, the only people that should be concerned about this is people that work outdoors. But even in the office environment, uh, dressing appropriately for your travel into, into work, you know, dress in layers, um, simple things like that. The other one is appropriate footwear. Um, we do see a lot of injuries even in, um, in the service industries, office environment, with people with slip, trip, and falls in the winter months. Uh, on ice, walkways, stairs, and in a lot of those instances, appropriate footwear 
um, would certainly help. It doesn't guarantee anything, but it helps minimize the risk. Um, you know, in your travel to and from your car, through parking lots, through stairs, through walkways that may or may not be appropriately uh, demelted, uh, you know, consider appropriate boots, footwear to get you in and safe to work, and then many people choose to have a secondary pair of work or dress shoes that they slip into in the workplace. That can do a lot to help minimize other, other winter-related injuries and illnesses. Well, thank you very much. You gave us a lot of information to help us keep us safe this winter. And I think next week we're going to talk about cold and flu issues and prevention issues for workers outside instead of indoor. Thank you for joining us this week on Labor Vision, Health Issues. Thank you. Since its beginning in 1980, the Institute for Labor Studies and Research had two homes in Providence. And then eventually, 22 years ago, we moved to the National Education Association building on 99 Bald Hill Road and were there for a long period of time, never really thinking that we were going to have to move as we grew. Thanks to the National Education Association, we were able to use their facilities upstairs, their training rooms. But bad news in February of 2014, the building suffered a fire and thankfully the next Tuesday we were back in business because the letter carriers offered their building. We moved in. It was supposed to be a temporary location and we stayed there for basically 18 months. For the last few months that we were there, we started looking for a new home, a home that could have all of the facilities, all of the offices that would really accommodate the growth that the Institute had been experiencing over the last 36 years. Well, welcome to our home. On December the 9th, we held an open house for the general public, for members of the government agencies that we work with, for our partners in business. And as you'll see later on during the film, a very successful event. We're very proud of our home and we'd like to share it with you today. So stay with us as we walk around. Stay with us as we experience a very special occasion. On December the 9th, we made a vision come true. We always committed to creating the Chuck V. Swartz Labor Library and the Frank Montanero Conference Room. In this film, you'll see that it came to fruition. We're very proud again of our building. Join us for a tour as we talk about the Institute and the programs that we do. Come join us. Come on in, everybody come in. John, you can grab everybody, get them in here. We're a close family here. Thanks. I just want to take a couple of minutes, first of all, to say thank you for you all for coming. I think you all have a tie to the Institute that's pretty unique. And some ties are newer than others, and some of the ties around here have been around for a long, long time. The Institute started in 1980. So there are some people in this room who are responsible for this place being here since <coughs> 1980. Um, you probably all remember Ron DiOrio and uh, um, Frank Montanero and Eddie McElroy, um, Paul McDonald, a whole group of people who were, particularly Eddie Mack, who had the vision of being able to say, organized labor needs a way of bringing about education and training to its leaders. And Eddie tells the story um, that it wasn't long after he went out for his first two or three visits and a lot of union leaders say, I don't need you to teach anybody how to take my job. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an uphill climb from that moment on. There was nothing easy about this thing. And eventually what ended up happening, people realized, you know, uh, that education and training was so important and the line was, well, you know, what if I train people and they leave? Well, the line is, what if you don't and they stay? It's a whole lot worse. So the, the Institute for Labor Studies and Research, really, um, it, it's dedicated to the education and training of organized labor, and it's because of the dedication of people like you, of union members, of people from the community, of people from business and industry and the court system people from DLT, the AFL-CIO, Working Rhode Island. We could go on forever, 
And, and the Institute has a relationship with about 8,500 people a year, and that's because of the dedication that you bring to the table, to the financial resources that you bring to the table. We wanted to take a little bit of time today. Uh, we had made a commitment quite a while ago that we would dedicate our library and um, our conference room to two very special people who are responsible for us being here today. Um, Dan Mello was the first executive director of the Institute, and he was followed by Chuck Swartz. Most people in this room know Chuck Swartz. And, and if you don't, just ask somebody beside you. They will tell you many stories. And in the way, same way Paul has a camera, everywhere Chuck went, he had a camera. Everywhere. People told him, put the camera away. And then he grew, put the camera away into a television program called Labor Vision. And so much so that even in the back room, we are developing our own short studio um, to continue to do Labor Vision in, in Chuck's memory. Um, and that will continue. It, I won't tell you the three nights a week that it's on. <laughs> Um, the other piece is, is Frank Montanero, and I'm not just going to say Frank, I'm going to say Frank and Madeline, because I don't think uh, it, it could have happened without both of them together. Um, Frank was the president of the AFL-CIO. Um, he actually hired me, and uh, Frank was, is absolutely committed, was absolutely committed to the Institute. So what we really want to do is recognize the good work that they have done to ensure that organized labor will be educated and trained and remain strong for a long time. Um, so I'm going to do two things. I'm going to first of all ask George Nee, the chairman of the board, to say a few words and then we'll unveil the, uh, the names on the door. Thanks Bob. And uh, for many of you who have uh, been on this journey for as many years as we've had the journey, you might be wondering what the hell is going on here. Uh, you, you've seen some of our earlier offices from the third floor at the 15 Jefferson Street where, where we started to the NEA who was very gracious in hosting us for a number of years and uh, never raised the rent which was always appreciated. <laughs> then we got up to the letter carriers hall and then we found this place and this I think is finally a place that we could have a dedication that would honor Frank and, and Chuck that uh, we weren't embarrassed to bring you into the building and do that. But anyway, again, we, on behalf of the board, uh, many of whom are here, um, I want to thank you for your support over the years, uh, the generosity you've had, your commitment uh, to the people who have helped support us. Um, I can say that, uh, I'll just take Chuck for a moment, because Chuck was what we call a, uh, a very controversial hire. When uh, Eddie, who had the vision to create a nonprofit educational institute, as the institute is, uh, went to hire Chuck, believe it or not, he was not accepted in the labor community. Uh, but he grew into that role, and people really loved him. And he was, you know, revered in the labor movement. He, he was the, you know, uh, just someone that, knowing him for as many years as many of us did. It was just total respect for the dedication he had for working people. And so, um, you know, I think this is a, a terrific uh, uh, opportunity to, you know, keep that memory alive. And Frank took, you know, when Eddie left, Frank, we have this kind of rule, I don't know where it came from, that the president of the AFL CEO becomes the chairman of the board even <laughs> even if they hadn't been on the board beforehand, so kind of a, kind of a succession plan without one. There could be no That's right. So, but, uh, you know, Frank was actually very helpful for me being hired by the AFL-CIO at about the same time Chuck was. There's a few people in this room that remember when Eddie went to hire me, several unions left the AFL-CIO. <laughs> so between Chuck and I, we have that bond of, uh, you know, not being initially accepted, as they say, but uh, we, we grew on people. But with Frank, Frank just took it to, you know, as they say, you know, cliche, the next level. But we have, we've got some stability now that we never had before. And uh, we're doing things that we were just dreaming of doing before. So it, it's really, Frank just was dedicated to this thing, put a tremendous amount of time into it. So um, we want to thank you for everything that you and Madeline have done for this and your commitment to the labor movement and working people of this state. So, you know, people will always know the name of Frank Montanaro and Chuck Schwartz. So thank you all. Very much.
The Institute for Labor Studies and Research is a private nonprofit educational institution that provides education and training to enable working Rhode Islanders and the labor movement to have a stronger voice in the workplace, to participate more effectively in Rhode Island's changing job market, and to create a more just and equitable society. Since 1980, the Institute has offered education and training programs that have improved the lives of over 135,000 Rhode Islanders. Whether individuals enrolled in non-credit personal enrichment courses, ESL and GED programs at the worksite, industrial certification preparation programs, or college courses leading to a degree, the Institute for Labor Studies and Research has been instrumental in changing the lives of Rhode Island workers. The Institute for Labor Studies and Research has been supporting businesses, labor unions, and workers since its very beginnings. Employers benefit when their workers stay educated and keep up with new technologies. An educated workforce will increase productivity, reduce errors and accidents, adapt to new methods. Their employees will communicate effectively. They'll understand instructions. They'll read personal policies and safety manuals. They'll qualify for transfers and promotion. And they'll understand the change in technology. In terms of unions, the Institute offers customized training and workshops for union leaders. Our offerings include labor relations, steward training, leadership skills, computer training, conflict resolution, public speaking, and effective communication and many, many more. Each day, we work with workers, Rhode Island workers, both members of organized labor and not. The Institute offers employees the opportunity to pursue their education in a convenient and supportive environment at their workplace so they can improve job skills, obtain a high school degree, learn English, improve reading and writing skills, in general, build a better future. We are very proud of our education and training programs here at the Institute. Our adult literacy project provides workplace adult education for workers at their place of employment. This program offers employees the opportunity to pursue their education in a convenient and supportive environment in their workplace. Those programs include English as a Second Language, adult basic education, high school equivalency preparation, technology training, customized classes that address job specific skills. We go so far as to offer programs in financial literacy and many, many more. And we look forward to another 36 years of supporting workers in the workplace. One of our foundation programs is the Institute's Workplace Rights Education Project. Its goal is to reach out and educate workers about their rights on the job. And it's accomplished by targeting mainly low-income and non-union workers. These workshops include such topics as workplace rights education, health and safety training for both youth and adults, labor relations training, immigrant workers' rights, workers' compensation, and most recently, we are so proud that for two summers now, we have set aside a block of training for more than 1,100 youth in the months of July and August in the area of youth rights on the job, health and safety, workers' compensation, keeping in mind that these programs have been delivered to between 1,100 and 1,200 young youth in the state at about 40 locations during that period. The Institute for Labor Studies and Research has established partnerships with several colleges, universities, and online course providers. These include the Community College of Rhode Island, Eastern Gateway Community College, and several others. The Institute has also entered into partnership with Ed2Go to offer hundreds of online non-credit courses ranging from personal enrichment to professional development and certificate preparation programs. Whether you're interested in face-to-face, instructor-led, or online courses, 
The Institute for Labor Studies and Research can help you attain a degree or a certificate that you're looking for. And in some cases, there are scholarships available. Fifteen years ago, individuals at the Institute came together and recognized the importance of creating a leadership program that could build tomorrow. Our Leadership for a Future program is, without a doubt, one of our premier programs. It's a collaborative program for community, religious, and labor organizations to provide an opportunity for emerging and established leaders to build long-term relationships among individuals from diverse backgrounds and communities. Leadership for a Future is an eight-session educational experience that brings like-minded, progressive, innovative people together to advocate for positive change in our communities and to develop the skills necessary to meet the demands of our ever-changing society. We believe that Leadership for a Future can make a difference with you. If you're interested in getting together with people who want to make sure that our communities remain strong and growing, call us here at the Institute. Here at the Institute, we're very fortunate to have Labor Vision as one of our ways of reaching out into the state, into the community, into the homes of the people who live in this state to be able to provide information on issues that we believe are very important. Labor Vision, which is produced by the Institute, is the only television show dedicated exclusively to issues concerning Rhode Island's working families. On each program, Labor Vision brings together experts and community leaders to form a panel that discusses a wide range of local and national labor issues with a special focus on important events of the day. In addition, the staff of Labor Vision conducts on-the-street, on-the-job interviews about issues important to working families. Our format has changed over the years and we hope you enjoy it. Our goal is to provide short segments. They might be five minutes, they may be 15 minutes, but segments that will educate you and inform you about the issues that working Rhode Islanders face each and every day. We would appreciate your input and any ideas for segments in the show. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.